The following comes from The Answer Book, a help book for Christians by Dr. Samuel C. Gipp. This is question number nine, titled, What is the LXX? Question mark. Answer, a figment of someone's imagination. Explanation. First, let's define what the LXX is supposed to be. An ancient document called, quote, the Letter of Aristeus revealed a plan to make an official translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in Greek. This translation was to be accepted as the official Bible of the Jews and was to replace the Hebrew Bible. Supposedly, this translation work would be performed by 72 Jewish scholars, question mark in parentheses, six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The supposed location of the work was to be Alexandria, Egypt. The alleged date of translation was supposedly around 250 B.C., during the 400 years of silence between the close of the Old Testament in 397 B.C. and the birth of Christ in approximately 4 B.C., due to a four-year error in the calendar, in parentheses. It has become known as the Septuagint, quote, the interpretation of the 70 elders, unquote. Also, it is represented by the Roman, question mark, numerals, whose combined value is 70, hence L equals 50, X equals 10, X equals 10. Why it isn't called the LXX11, I'll never know. In other words, 72, since... That's how many scholars there were, supposedly. Continuing on, this so-called letter of Aristeus is the sole evidence for the existence of this mystical document, a.k.a. the Septuagint. There are absolutely no Greek Old Testament manuscripts existent with a date of 250 B.C. or anywhere near it. Neither is there any record in Jewish history of such a work being contemplated or performed. When pressed to produce hard evidence of the existence of such a document, scholars quickly point to Origen's Hexapla, written around 200 AD, or approximately 450 years later than the LXX was supposedly penned, and more than a hundred years after the New Testament was completed. The second column of Origen's Hexapla contains his own, hardly 72 Jewish scholars, Greek translation of the Old Testament, including spurious books such as Bell and the Dragon, Judith, and Tobit, and other apocryphal books accepted as author authoritative only by the Roman Catholic Church. Proponents of the invisible LXX, or Septuagint, will try to claim that Origen didn't translate the Hebrew into Greek, but only copied the LXX into the second column of his Hexapla. Can this argument be correct? No. If it were, then that would mean that those astute 72 Jewish scholars added the apocryphal books to their work before they were ever written. Or else, Origen took the liberty to add these spurious writings to God's holy word. Revelation 22.18 Thus we see that the second column of the Hexapla is Origen's personal, unveilable translation of the Old Testament into Greek and nothing more. Eusebius and Philo, both of questionable character, make mention of a Greek Pentateuch. Hardly the entire Old Testament and, and not mentioned as any kind of officially accepted translation. Is there any Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament written before the time of Christ? Yes. There is one minute scrap dated at 150 BC. The Rylands Papyrus number 458. It contains Deuteronomy chapters 23 to 28. No more. 
no less. In fact, it may be the existence of this fragment that led Eusebius and Philo to assume the entire Pentateuch had been translated by some scribe in an effort to interest Gentiles in the history of the Jews. It is most cer- it most certainly cannot be a portion of any pretended official Old Testament translation into Greek. We can rest assured that those 72 jo- Jewish scholars supposedly chosen for the work in 250 B.C. would be just a, a mite feeble by 150 B.C. Besides, the non-existence of any reason to believe such a translation was ever produced are several hurdles which the letter of Ar- Arataeus, or Origins Hexapla, Rhineland's number 458, and Eusebius and Philo just cannot clear. The first one is the letter of Aristeus itself. There is little doubt among scholars today that it was not written by anyone named Aristeus. In fact, some believe its true author is Philo. This would give it an A.D. date. If this were true, then, its real intention would be to deceive believers into thinking that Origen's second column is a copy of the Septuagint, a feat that is that was apparently accomplished, quote-unquote, in spades. If there was an Aristeus, he was faced with two insurmountable problems. First, how did he ever locate the twelve tribes in order to pick his six representative scholars from each? Having been thoroughly scattered by their many defeats and captivities, the tribal lines of the twelve tribes had long since been dissolved into virtual non-existence. It was impossible for anyone to directly identify the twelve individual tribes. Secondly, if the twelve tribes had been identified, they, they would not have undertaken such a translation for two compelling reasons. Number one, every Jew knew the official caretaker of the scripture was the tribe of Levi, as evidenced in Deuteronomy 12, or sorry, 17, 18, 31, 25, and 26, and Malachi 2, 7. Thus, no Jew of any of the eleven other tribes would dare join such a forbidden enterprise. Number two, it is obvious to any reader of the Bible that the Jews were to be distinctly different from the Gentile nations around them. Unto them was given such distinct practices as circumcision, Sabbath worship, sundry laws of cleansing, and their own homeland. Added to this is the heritage of the Hebrew language. Even today, practicing Jews in China and India refuse to teach their children any language but Hebrew. The Falasha Jews of Ethiopia were distinct among the many tribes of their country, by the fact that they jealously retained the Hebrew language as an evidence of their Jewish heritage. Are we to be so naive as to believe that the Jews who consider Gentiles nothing more than dogs would willingly forsake their heritage, the Hebrew language, for a Gentile language, into which would be translated the holiest possession of all, their Bible? Such a supposition is as insane as it is absurd. When, then, one might ask, of the numerous quotes in the New Testament of the Old Testament that are ascribed, sorry, what then? What then, one might ask, of the numerous quotes in the New Testament of the Old Testament that are ascribed to the Septuagint? The Septuagint they speak of is nothing more than the second column of Origins Hexapla. The New Testament quotations are not quotes of any Septuagint or the Hexapla. They are the author, the Holy Spirit, taking the liberty of quoting his work in the Old Testament and interpreting it in whatever manner he wishes. And we can rest assured that he certainly is not quoting any non-existent Septuagint. Only one more question arises, then. Why are scholars so quick to accept the existence of the Septuagint in the face of such irrefutable arguments against it? The answer is sad and simple. Hebrew is an extremely difficult language to learn. It takes years of study to attain a passing knowledge of it, and many more to be well enough versed to use it as a vehicle of study. By comparison, a working knowledge of Greek is easily attainable. Thus, 
If there was an official translation of the Old Testament into Greek, Bible critics could triple the field of influence overnight without a painstaking study of biblical Hebrew. Unfortunately, the acceptance of the existence of the Septuagint on such thin evidences is based solely on pride and voracity. But stop and think. Even if such spurious documents as the Septuagint really did exist, how could a Bible critic who, in reference to the King James Bible, say that, quote, no translation has the authority of the original language, unquote, claim in the same breath that his pet Septuagint has equal authority with the Hebrew original. This scholarly double talk is nothing more than a self-exalting authority striving to keep his scholarly position above those, quote, unschooled in the original languages, unquote. If you accept such an argument, I have a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn, exclamation point. But so, um, what I would add here is, as the author mentioned, it is the Roman church that says that these spurious books that came from the Septuagint, uh, such as Tobit, the Roman church alone says must be accepted as inspired. Even Jews don't view those books that way, at least not Orthodox Jews. And um, if you look up the Bolandus you will find out that paleography or the quote-unquote dating, subscribing dates to manuscripts, was birthed out of disputes between the French-Dominican Jean Mabillon and uh, Jean Boland, a Jesuit. So, in other words, the art of dating manuscripts, i.e. forging the date of manuscripts, comes from the Jesuits. And there is no evidence that the Septuagint, quote-unquote, was actually translated when people say it was. And so, since the Roman Catholic Church alone teaches that it must be accepted as authoritative, or at least the apocryphal books, associated that ultimately come from it well again we find all roads lead to rome and it should be no marvel that in the age that we're living in that there's a movement to get people to embrace the septuagint and to try to say that christ is quoting the septuagint even though it didn't even exist then etc because if they can get people to embrace the Septuagint, then they're ultimately going to embrace the Apocrypha that are part of it, which ultimately, if one accepts as authoritative, is going to lead them back to Rome. Because the Apocrypha books teach doctrines that are exclusive to Roman Catholicism.